Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently have had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. We're going to range it far tonight. We're going to start out with a book critic, but not any book critic. We're going to start with Christopher Lehman Hout, who died recently at the age of 84, and he was perhaps the preeminent book critic in the United States for nearly three decades. He was the New York Times senior book critic from 1969 to 1995. He was of German and Scottish descent, but he was a New Yorker all the way around, even though he was born in Scotland during a trip his parents made there. He was educated in some of New York City's top prep schools at the Yale School of Drama, but he admitted to getting his training to learn how to read books as an undergraduate at Swarthmore. I learned how to read, which is took a long time, and very few people master the art of, but it's how to take a book and and bet it in a matter of minutes and and figure out how to read it, what to read of it. And that was the most important part of my job in in vetting um, perhaps 25, 30, 40, 50,000 books during the course of my career. Well, you heard it there, 50,000 books. So he was a make or break person in terms of sales and in terms of taste. He was a creature of the New York Times. He knew all the ins and outs of the place. He was on a first-name basis with all the important people like Abe Rosenthal, the managing editor. Abe Rosenthal was a right-winger, and Christopher Lehman Hauf was a left-winger, but they got along just fine at the newspaper. In the year 2000, he became the chief obituary writer for the New York Times, so I guess that makes him sort of a professional cousin of mine. And the only time he had a byline on the front page was for one of his obituaries. After reading a bunch of Christopher Lehman Haupt's reviews in the New York Times, I'll say about him the best thing you can say about a literary critic. He was always scrupulously fair. Well, we're going to move on now to Tom Jago, who died recently at the age of 93. And when I say on this program, we cover people who've changed our history, our society, or our culture. Tom Jago definitely changed my culture. I don't know about any of you listeners. Tom Jago was the British liquor executive who developed Bailey's Irish Cream. I'm not known to be a drinker, but I do have a nice slug of Bailey's Irish Cream with my coffee every morning. And in fact, I'm going to have one right now. Mmm, that's good. Sure makes your mocha taste better in the morning. Here's the BBC Four last word with Matthew Bannister on Tom Jago and Bailey's Irish Cream. Tom Jago was the talented marketeer who launched some of the UK's best-known alcoholic drinks. Working first for international distillers and vintners, he had a knack of creating compelling identities for even the most unpromising beverages. Tom Jago was born in Camelford in North Cornwall. He had an idyllic childhood which often involved long cycle rides and camping. So how did his career begin? His daughter, Rebecca Jago. My father was at Oxford and decided he wanted to be a photographer when he came down. And he went for an interview with his portfolio and attended the wrong interview and had a job as a copywriter at the end of the interview (laughs) with an advertising agency. But did he take to it naturally? No, he wasn't a very good copywriter. So he moved quite quickly into the account management side, which is where he became client facing and thence from advertising to client side and into marketing. Let's talk about some of the things that he came up with. Bailey's Irish Cream. How did that start? Gilby's was part of Grand Met, which owned a loss-making whiskey distillery in Ireland. Grand Met also owned Express Dairies, and with the move towards more skimmed milks, there was a, a cream lake. So my father was tasked with finding something to do with loss-making whiskey and the cream too. And, of course, there were huge tax incentives from the Irish government to to export and manufacture in Ireland. That is what led to Bailey's. Bailey's, let your senses guide you. So we just put some Irish whiskey and some cream in a blender. And that didn't taste very nice, so they added some Nesquik. (laughs) Simple as that. How did it go down with the focus groups when they tested it? No, not at all. It didn't go down well? They all thought it tasted like something you take for indigestion. Kaolin and morphine. Exactly. (laughs) But without the morphine effect, I think. Nobody liked it, but I think they were convinced it had success written on it. And it was groundbreaking. Where better to enjoy a drink that tastes like heaven? With orange or pineapple. Little Bailey's, little mocha, and a crispy cream donut does taste like heaven, I'll tell you that. We're going to move on now to Wally Triplett, who died recently at the age of 92. An amazing guy. He was the first black player to play at Penn State. He was the first black player to play in the Cotton Bowl. 
He was the third black player to be drafted by the NFL. We did George Taylor Farrell's podcast a couple of weeks back. He was the first player. And Wally Triplett was the first black player who was drafted to play in the NFL. He had a great college career at Penn State. I'll touch more on that in a second. They were number four in the country when they played against SMU in the 1948 Cotton Bowl. SMU was number three in the country, and they were led by their all-everything Heisman Trophy winner, Doak Walker, who ironically became a teammate of Wally Triplett's when they were both on the Lions several years later. That game ended in a tie, and both guys joked about it later on, when Wally Triplett scored a touchdown while he was being guarded by Doak Walker. Wally Triplett's NFL career was pretty nondescript. He did have one memorable game where he averaged 73 yards on kickoff returns, but even though he was a trailblazer in the NFL in terms of race relations, it wasn't like Jackie Robinson. He was actually overshadowed by Marion Motley, who came into the league just after him and became one of the great halfback fullbacks in NFL history. And then a couple years after that by Jim Brown, who was the greatest fullback in NFL history. But Wally Triplett has a special place in Penn State lore because, as he tells here, he may have been the inspiration for the legendary Penn State cheer, We Are Penn State. This was as a result of their deciding not to play the University of Miami, who didn't want to play them, because they had a black player on the team. Here's Wally Triplett telling the story. My name is Wally Triplett, and this is my Penn State football story. And we were fortunate in that we were able to uh, live in a community that uh, was um, unique in that it was an integrated community, suburban Philadelphia. But we were the people who serviced the big estates and so the mistake that was made very often when we gave our address was that people who didn't see us thought that we were, were white. I was asked by the University of Miami because of where we lived. They wanted to give a scholarship and they wrote me and then I immediately wrote them back. And when I wrote them back explaining it, they wrote an apologetic letter. Now, uh, the odd part about that was right after that, I went to Penn State, and on the 1946 schedule was the University of Miami. So the question then came up, well, what are we going to do about this up at Penn State? The trend was throughout the National Collegiate Athletics that the uh, it was agreement that where situations like that arose, the... Uh, school with the black players would not play them against the the southern teams when this question came up the uh, fellows immediately uh, said we're going to play all or we're going to play none and happened to kind of bring us together like i said because from now on i understood these older guys who had come back from the war and the things that they had been through and they were standing up for it it came down to their part of our team we're a team, and they can play as well as anyone else. And why deny them just because of the color of their skin? We're in this together. We're a football team. So Miami and Penn State canceled that game because it couldn't be. Right after we had the West Virginia game is when the uh, the voting came up. And I can remember Steve Suey saying at the completion of our winning, uh, when he was challenged, when he said, now that we've won, are we going to have to have these meetings about what to do? At the time, Steve Suey said simply, we're Penn State. There'll be no meetings. And I said, I learned later on that, that phrase, we're Penn State, turned into we are Penn State. It was years later that I'm talking to a it's a friend of our, ours, and at that time, that simple phrase had been turned into a cheer and had also been developed into uh, almost uh, idolic, as you would say, because they had the banners and everything about we are Penn State. I said, but I'll never forget the simple way in which Steve Suey phrased it. Are we going to have to have these meetings again? And he said, we're Penn State. There'll be no meetings. And that was it. 
Deep Suey, first family of Penn State football. I also want to mention that Wally Triple was a true patriot, very patriotic guy. He fought in the Korean War. That interrupted his NFL career. And he always made a point of mentioning how proud he was of his country. In fact, he decried this modern trend towards kneeling during the national anthem. He really didn't like that. And if anybody had a right to be upset, believe me, it would have been him. Wally Triplett, great football player, great guy. Well, we're going to make a brief mention of Ron Johnson, who died recently at the age of 71. He was one of the best running backs I ever saw for the University of Michigan in the late 1960s. And he was also a star for the New York Giants in the early 70s, the first giant running back to gain 1,000 yards in a season. He was big, he was powerful, and he was fast. And he could run inside or he could run outside. Unquestionably, the greatest game he ever had was in 1968 against the University of Wisconsin. In fact, it was almost 50 years ago to the day of the day he died. It was only about a week before that 50th anniversary. Here is the University of Michigan MGO blog, football blog, describing Ron Johnson's game that day. November 16th, 2018 will mark the 50-year anniversary of one of the greatest individual performances in Michigan football history. Ron Johnson, Michigan All-American running back and future All-Pro running back with the New York Giants, set Michigan's all-time rushing record. It was a nasty weather day at a half-full Michigan stadium. Only 51,117 witnessed history that day. The weather featured sleet, a driving rain, and was 45 degrees of kickoff, according to the box score. Ron Johnson ran for 347 yards on 31 carries, averaging 11.2 yards per rush. His five rushing touchdowns are also an official Michigan single-game record that have stood the test of time. With only one player since going over 300 yards, will this record ever be broken? I might mention that that record is from the post-1949 era. They didn't keep good statistics before that, and someone may have had more yards in that era. The other interesting thing about Ron Johnson is his brother was Alex Johnson, the good hit no field outfielder for a number of teams, a troublesome guy, but a great hitter. He won the 1970 American League batting title by a couple of percentage points over Kyle Yastrzemski. Unlike Ron, who was a good soldier all the time, Alex had some, well, let's say, attitude problems on and off the field. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. And we're going to close tonight with Francis Lay, who died recently at the age of 86. He was a French composer, worked primarily on films, although he worked with some of the most notable French artists, including Edith Piaf, Johnny Holliday, whose podcast we've done, and Charles Aznavour, whose podcast we just did a couple of weeks ago. But as I said, it was in movies he found his greatest acclaim, and his opus magnum was in 1970 when he wrote the score for Love Story. Now, those of you who listen to this program know I'm not a big fan of Love Story, and I'm not even a big fan of the song, which was a huge international hit. He won an Academy Award for it in 1971. It was the only Academy Award Love Story guy. Can you believe that? Neither Ryan O'Neill nor Ally McGraw got an Academy Award for Love Story. Henry Mancini did a decent instrumental version of it, but the one that was the big hit top ten in both the United States and the UK was by Andy Williams with lyrics by Carl Sigmund. Don't like it that much, but the job compels me to play it. say this about Andy Williams. He could take a lot of marginal songs and make them good. You'd think that might be our closing tribute to Francis Lay, but you'd be wrong. He wrote another song that I liked better from the 1966 film A Man and a Woman, directed by his partner Claude Lelouch. Got nominated for an Oscar, didn't win. Personally, I think it's a better song. It's a little bit of elevator music, but I got Johnny Mathis singing it. Johnny Mathis is another guy who can take marginal material and make it good, but this is a pretty good song. We're going to close with the theme from A Man and a Woman as a tribute to Francis Lay. When hearts are passing in the night, in the lonely night, then they thus hold each other tight, oh so very tight, and take a chance that in the light, in tomorrow's light, they'll stay together. So much in love.